Hi. I think we're going to have a screen change. I don't know if that's the screen I wanted, but no. <laughs> oh, that, was, that looked like a good one. OK. So it's off for now. All right. My name is Shannon Jackson. Welcome. I'm a, <laughs> oh, thank you for a little clap there. <laughs> Uh, I'm Associate Vice Chancellor for the Arts and Design here at UC Berkeley, and it is a, a poignant pleasure to welcome you to the last event in our Arts and Design Monday series, which actually turns out to be the last event in all of the programming that we've been helping enable uh, through the Arts and Design Initiative with many different campus organizations, uh, including tonight's series, which has been pursuing and thinking about the future of cultural criticism in the digital age. And it has been all throughout every Monday and something we want to continue through next year, a chance for us to ha open the museum, BAM PFA, open this beautiful theater to talks and dialogues that feature the people and ideas that most compel the Berkeley faculty and the students who work with us. So it's, uh, it's been a really great experiment and pilot this term and we're gonna keep it going. We're gonna really work hard to keep it going all through next year. So hope to see you next year uh, on Monday nights, on Wednesdays, and also uh, if you are interested in helping participate and make sure this kind of programming happens, do let me know. Um, we, we love involvement from the community that we're um, really privileged to serve. So before I introduce our speaker today, I thought I'd start with a quote from him. It was posted on November 9th, 2016. The other night, as the votes rolled in, I started to get really upset that my parents were seeing what was happening. It sounds weird, but those were my first thoughts, and they've been sticking with me. It's partly my own damaged psyche, but I feel ashamed that this happened. My dad survived the Holocaust, lost his entire family, fought with the partisans, and is a full-fledged hero. My mom survived Kristallnacht 78 years ago today. She escaped to a children's home in France and eventually made her way to America, where she's been working to help educate people and, and ooh, <laughs> I told you it was poignant, and prejudice of all types for her entire adult life. They took the absolute worst life could offer. They saw the worst their fellow citizens of their fellow citizens right down to their next door neighbors. Imagine bad, trust me, it was worse, but somehow they're not angry people. They're not hateful. They are good, smart, deeply aware of international issues and news junkies. They never looked away from the world, no matter how bleak the view. So that's written by Dave Pell, son of Ida Pell and Joe Pell, who clearly has carried on a legacy shared by his parents for being better neighbors, for not being hateful, and also for being good and smart and aware of international issues, and yes, a news junkie. For the last several years, Dave Pell, a Cal alum, and former Mike Mann here at Berkeley, a cultural critic, a tech-savvy cultural leader, has turned his news, news junkie propensities into an amazing cultural platform, Next Draft, one that deploys frank, sober, ironic, hilarious, and often self-deprecating commentary on the daily news. And I can feel him being self-deprecating now. Like, why did she call me a cultural leader? You're a leader, dude. Okay, okay, good, thank you. Oh, he's accepted, okay. He helps, I think, he helps all of us as readers to see the news anew and to see our lives anew, whether he's speaking at South by Southwest or at City Arts and Lectures or here at UC Berkeley. Um, and so he's with us here on May Day to mark the 100th day of the presidency after recalling those thoughts that I just shared after the election. And I just wanted to share before we start again just a few more reflections that he's offered since in his 100 days since the inauguration. Consider samples from his daily 100-day diary. Day one, Donald Trump is sworn in as president and promises to end American carnage. He gives his speech in the rain, although he will later insist that the skies cleared when he spoke. <laughs> My son walks into the room as I watch the inauguration. Dad, are you crying? Day three. Kellyanne Conway introduces the world to the phrase, alternate facts. My shrink and I decide we should go for, from meeting four days a week to meeting five days a week. <laughs> Day eight, Trump issues the Muslim ban. I look at my calendar, realize it's only been one week. It's 
Spicer says this, this was the first time in our nation's history that floor coverings have been used to protect the grass on the mall. That had the effect of highlighting any areas where people were not standing while in years past the grass eliminated this visual. The statement is false. <laughs> the statement is false. Surprise! And everyone is quite sure that that must be the most ridiculous statement Sean Spicer will ever make. Jump ahead to day 36. Trump refers to the members of the media as the enemies of the American people. My daughter says, Daddy, aren't you a member of the media? <laughs> After about 45 minutes, I'm able to convince her that I'm just a news curator. <laughs> Say it, news curator. Day 38, the nation becomes aware of the scotch tape that Trump uses to keep his tie in place. It's the first time I feel like we might have common ground. Jump way ahead to day 92. With a week to go, Trump decides the 100-day mark, which he talked about so much, is actually a media creation. And suddenly I realize I sort of miss Kellyanne Conway. <laughs> OK, so these and so many other reflections, it seems to me, cover daily life and cultural life and political life in a way that frames and reframes, and also gives us a little window into Pell's extraordinary family. Uh, it seems to be a place, of course, where grandparents are uh, carrying on a legacy of courage and compassion and a place where, to quote another member of the Pell family household, people are perennially curious and curious about life's curiosities. So it's also a place where kids learn this word news curator which actually might have been an apt title for this series because all throughout we've been thinking about what the role of digital platforms are in enabling or not public dialogue. What does it mean to think about digital material as a kind of uh, uh, medium and material for producing dialogue and for foreclosing dialogue? And I don't think we could have imagined a better person to help us mark 100 days thinking about this topic then Dave Pell, I hope you will help me welcome him to the stage. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Shannon. Um, I am a news curator. I'm also a remarkably inappropriate public speaker, so I appreciate you risking your career with this uh, <laughs> gathering. Uh, about 30 years ago, almost to the day, I. Uh, submitted a speech to try to give my speech when I was graduating as an English major from Cal and it got rejected. So I thought instead of talking about Trump, which everybody is sick of, I'll just uh, give that speech today. <laughs> um, so I'm standing here behind a laptop, which is apt because uh, this is sort of, you're seeing the beast in his own habitat. This is what I do, I rarely get out. I am a social media news junkie. And as Shannon mentioned, we're, we're sort of celebrating or not celebrating the 100 days of Trump, uh, or as it's better known in Berkeley, the 100 days of Xanax. Um, I've taken so much anti-anxiety medication in the last 100 days that I've achieved a state known as functional comatose. So I really appreciate people coming out tonight to hear me talk about a topic that is both a topic you're sick of and a topic that's horribly depressing. But hopefully we can have a little bit of fun with it. Uh, if he can have fun with a nuclear-armed North Korea, why can't we have fun with uh, talking about the news? Uh, I also came up with the uh, an official hat of Berkeley. Uh, it shouldn't be red, of course, but neither should the hallways here at BAM PFA, so <laughs> let myself off the hook. I would ask people to turn off their cell phones and other devices, but I'm constantly on my laptop or my devices, so me asking you to turn off your cell phone would be like Cheech and Chong asking for a no smoking section. So leave them on if you want to. The last time I talked about this topic was actually in Austin, and uh, which was at South by Southwest, which was a little bit slightly more tense for a few reasons. One, uh, it's a red state. Uh, two, uh, they don't have Uber or Lyft there, which for a Bay Area person is pretty crazy. And as Shannon sort of alluded to, I live through the news. It's my way of uh, absorbing the world. So I had to check the Austin news right before I spoke. And this was the headline that I saw. So uh, obviously it was in incredibly <laughs> tense during that speech. Uh, so I thought here I'd be in a safe place where I would be completely relaxed and poison free. Um, 
home in my home of UC Berkeley. And then, of course, in the last week, I see that this is how UC Berkeley is being portrayed in the news. So I, funny, I don't really remember. I don't know if things have changed that much, uh, but I, I don't remember that giant fireball from my birthday experience. <laughs> when I was going to Berkeley in the 80s, we had a lot of uh, people with sort of long, blonde, damaged hair and crazy thoughts walking around campus mumbling to themselves, and nobody really made a big deal out of it. Suddenly now it's the top of Fox News. But after, we, uh, after I present, if you guys want to talk a little bit about what's going on with that kind of stuff, I think it's worth it. But uh, the main thought I have about this is Fox News is always going to push this if there's a way that we can not let uh, take the bait so much and give the people a megaphone for being imbeciles. It would be, I think, a helpful move. Um, so anyway, like Shannon said, my name is Dave Pell. I'm the managing editor of the internet. <laughs> and uh, it's a pretty, pretty big job. Shannon mentioned in her, uh, you already know my parents are highly superior to me, but we did, I did grow up in a family because of their experiences in the Holocaust and just being worldly smart people that we sort of talked about news uh, regularly, especially when it was just me. My sisters were all older than me when they moved out. That was basically our topic of conversation. We had two topics of conversation, either uh, the news or anti-Semitism. And I'll hit both of those tonight. But uh, we talked about the news constantly. And even when I went to college, I remember when I was here, my dad would call in a typical conversation would be like, uh, hello, hey, what's cooking? Uh, not much, how's it going? What do you think of this Gorbachev guy? And that was basically it. We'd go immediately from this, a normal conversation where people might exchange uh, human pleasantries to the news of the day. And that was uh, basically uh, all the time. Even tonight uh, during uh, the pre-talk reception, my dad and I uh, said hello and then immediately went to uh, the Civil War nonsense that we heard today. But that's just what we talk about. So now if you imagine a, a person who grows up sort of addicted to the news when I move to a new city, the first thing I'd do is like make sure I had cable so I could get Bernard Shaw and CNN in my room. That was my friend I needed. Uh, that is really the way I experienced the world. If I moved to a new city, I would experience that place through media. And now you have that sort of, I would say, slightly damaged personality meets the internet where you have a constant influx of news coming out you constantly. Uh, so the damage grew when I started writing this newsletter where I go to about 75 to 100 news sites a day. I pick out the top 10 most fascinating news items, write my own sort of summary of what it is, write the blurb and share those blurbs out with people. And uh, so I sort of have a news problem and I use the internet to make the problem worse but also to make it somehow useful to other people. But then that situation met Trump, which is the most love him or hate him, and I, suppose, I assume most people here in the, in the latter category, there's no doubt it's the most unbelievable story, political or otherwise, of our lifetime. So what has that created me? Uh, I'm a sick, I'm an addicted, pathetic, sick, twitchy, impulsive, self-righteous, media-obsessed screen junkie. And uh, in other words, uh, I'm basically an extreme version of the worst parts of you. I think of myself sort of as a, as a canary in a coal mine, except for uh, Scott Pruitt insists that it's a clean coal mine. Um, I, always, I had a dream the other night that a canary uh, died in the lobby of the EPA. But I am a, so I, I, I am a sufferer of uh, what I call PTSD, and that's President Trump stress disorder. Uh, and I'm not the only one who has it. Uh, a lot of people do. Um, I would say, like I say, I'm the canary in the coal mine, so what terrible experiences I'm having in my mind, you will soon have. Uh, everybody's addicted to this story. Even news professionals can't give up. Uh, I can't, sorry, can't keep, they want to give up, but they can't keep up. Uh, here's Brian Stelter on CNN, who's used to be a cable news uh, columnist and now is their media guy. He said, I have a hard time keeping up with all the developments, and I'm in the news business. So if he can't keep up, what can other people do? I call that helter-stelter. Just too much news. People can't come up. I don't think it's a coincidence that the circus went bankrupt this year because as Wayne Barrett, <laughs> Wayne Barrett recently passed away, but he was the number one most knowledgeable sort of biographer of Trump, sort of the New York Trump, and he always called him the, the greatest show on earth. And like I said, love him or hate him, it's, we're obsessed. Everybody's obsessed. I mean, remember when we all thought that, uh, oh, whoops, 
that's the wrong slide. Oh, well. It's such a big story. Actually, sorry, it's such a big story. I don't know if you guys remember, about a month ago, uh, McDonald's had a big controversy when they tweeted something. It's just obviously some intern, but tweeted something about uh, Trump. It's like Trump news is so ubiquitous now that it comes with fries. Does anybody remember when we used to be totally sure that this would be the most unbelievable, unthinkable news story of our lifetimes? I mean, think about it. This was a completely unthinkable story. Uh, the hanging chads, the lawsuits, the court cases, month and a half without a president. And this doesn't even compare. This is not, this month and a half of this doesn't compare to one day of Trump. I like to think of Trump, for those who were around during the OJ thing, that white Ford Bronco chase, like if that just went on for like months and months and months. That's sort of Trump. Um, so I also, I think the guy on the left now drives an Uber, so the world changes. But so as an example of my addiction and my wife who's here and everybody who knows me can attest to it, it's pretty torturous for those around me. But one night I was... A, about a few weeks ago, I was watching a show. It's a new show called Legion, and I like the internet, but I love television. And I was watching Legion. It was a really, it's, the first episode is a really good show if you want to try it. It's a totally absorbing show. You're like into it. You're locked in. But for me, that means that I can go about five minutes without thinking about Trump. And uh, about 20 minutes into it, seriously, I had to stop, pause the show, because I felt like I had to write a think piece about something that Rachel Maddow had said on her show earlier that night. Now, it's... This is not an, idea, an original idea. This was not Da Vinci coming up with something here. I just saw something on MSNBC, and I felt like I had to share my reflections urgently at 11.30 on a weeknight. So that was the first sign of the problem. And then I later uh, I started watching the show again, and then after about 20 more minutes, I thought, oh, this tweet came into my mind, and I just couldn't resist letting this tweet out. I felt this was so urgent that at 11.45, Western, West Coast time was so important that I got it out. And this was the tweet. I'm just a guy watching the stories unfold from my couch, but my gut tells me there's more to Comey's part in all of this. Now, this is obviously the ramblings of an incredibly sick person on his couch. Uh, I am a medical marijuana card holder, so that might have played some role in it. But as sick as I am to feel the need to stop the show and do this, that this is what my life is about, this is not this night either. This is every night. Look at this down here. There's 580 people who are up at home liking this garbage. So I realized during this night that the title of my presentation had to be How Trump Ru News Ruined My Life. That doesn't, actually that title doesn't seem quite done. Let me fix that. There we go. <laughs> and it's not just me. Um, there's news junkies everywhere. I said I, I saw a friend of uh, mine and my wife who's not a news person at a hotel, I mean at an airport recently, and he said that in order to cope with Trump news, he stopped checking his news in the morning, and instead he listens to Buddhist meditation tapes. Um, Trump has not attacked Buddhism yet, but it will come, and it will ruin that tape. But uh, then another friend of mine, Andy, who is like not into news, does not read Next Draft, doesn't care about news, and is gloriously free from it, even he has been sucked in and tells me that sometimes he's on the freeway and he can't wait to get home and watch CNN which I don't necessarily re recommend, but it shows how extreme it is. And then there's this stat that I thought perfectly uh, <laughs> summarizes where Americans are in this. Uh, see, Gina, it's not just me. <laughs> but um, So I started doing this thing in order to uh, sort of process how crazy this news is, because it really is, if you think you're the only person who thinks it's crazy, you're not. It's totally absurd. I think the funniest thing is people, you know, let's say the Berkeley type, People like us have this incredible fear that don't normalize this, don't normalize this. It's so impossible that any, that's the least, the last thing we have to worry about. He is not going to be normalized. He is totally, every day he surprises us with something new. And you thought he was, you're going to normalize the Civil War story? I don't think so. So uh, I started doing this thing where I take real headlines as I'm going through collecting news. And I, if they're really weird, I paste them into the Onion template. And I don't change a word. And these are mainstream news sites, Washington Post, New York Times, you know, The Hill, Politico, nothing weird, nothing extremely left, just pretty main, well, of course, the alt-right would say it's extremely left, but mainstream news sites, I take those headlines and I place them into the Onion template. And every time it works without changing a, a single word. And here's just a few examples of them. 
Scott Pruitt heads to coal mine to pitch new EPA agenda. <laughs> Trump touts Easter egg roll amid reports his White House is unprepared. <laughs> Obit, man died peacefully after falsely told Trump was impeached. Again, that's the LA Times, okay? These are, these are all real. You're not crazy. This is happening to you. Trump's ethical transgressions are multiplying. What happens if there are too many to track? I think we reached that point already. Four hours at the White House with Ted Nugent, Sarah Palin, and Kid Rock. Uh, Trump Jr. slammed for hunting possibly pregnant par prairie dogs. And that really is real. He went hunting with a guy from the NRA. Uh, I'm sure they're really a, a force to deal with. Report Trump won't fire Spicer because the guy gets great ratings. And a lot of these you've probably heard because we're all obsessed and it's everywhere. Trump, I gave the face of the, nation, face of the nation the highest rating since the World Trade Center came down. Congratulations. Oh, don't boo. He got good ratings, folks. You got to get into the spirit of this guy. Uh, we got Trump insists Mexico will eventually, at a later date, in some form, pay for the wall. Uh, let's see. Exclusive. Trump says he thought being president would be easier than his old life. Uh, it's, we thought it would be easier to impeach him, so we have something in common there, I guess. Uh, now, I did not, I told myself for sure I'm not going to change this presentation any time in the last 24 hours before I come here because that's the problem with Trump news. If you have a presentation a week later, it's all old and everybody's on to the next thing, which some people say is by design. There's absolutely no way that what he's doing is by design. He's not playing chess while we're playing checkers. He, this is his personality. He has been his personality since his earliest days as a developer in New York, the falsehoods, all of it. It's all been part of the act. It never changes. It is not some part of a political strategy. There's no way. It works as one, but it's not part of one. So I do not want to pick tonight after today to say, get into a debate about what caused the Civil War, even though Trump might have questions about why that happened. So let's not get into that. Just move on. Oh, whoops, I had to have a slide about that. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just in case anybody's not quite sure, and hopefully that'll be helpful. Uh, next, I want to do a couple of, uh, oh, by the way, uh, he was talking about Andrew Jackson, opinion on the uh, Civil War, even though Andrew Jackson was dead 16 years before and was a renowned slave owner, but he could have made a deal, apparently, so uh, I wouldn't be surprised this week if Trump announces that Andrew Jackson and Frederick Douglass are going to be appearing on a panel at Mar-a-Lago. Um, and if this seems too inside baseball, sorry, man, I'm so deep I can't get out, so... Put me in a straight jacket, blame Shannon. She knew what she was getting into here. So I want to start by, start after this bizarre intro of what we're dealing with to sort of come up with a few rules for journalists. And I want to make it clear that I'm, I am sort of of the media, but I'm not a member of any, uh, I'm not a, an official journalist. Uh, maybe a, a modern, I write a modern day column, but I don't work with any uh, media outlets. Um, I do consider myself an enemy of the American people, along with other journalists that have been labeled as such. But I, I really see it more as a lit review. So I think of myself as sort of an uber consumer of news. And so here's a few of the rules that I've come up with journalists. And I'll, I'll talk about some of those, and then I'll talk about why none of them are going to make much difference, even if they're followed. Uh, so a few rules for journalists. The first one is every reporter is a war reporter. Um, we know that in the early days of the administration, Bannon and the other lunatics uh, labeled the American people and Trump as the enemy of the American people. I don't believe that Trump views journalists as the enemy of the American people. He's much more hands-on in terms of having personal relationship with journalists than Obama was. He writes personal notes. He loves giving his autograph out to them. He prints out articles journalists write and send it to their office. He is obsessed with getting coverage in the news. He absolutely loves the news, but he is... One of his techniques is to constantly downplay the media so that when stories come out about him, they're, of course, uh, not as effective. In a way, maybe all's fair in politics, but this is the one area, a lot of the stuff I'll talk about tonight is sort of a little bit light because the topic is uh, upsetting, but this is one I feel pretty strongly about because it's, when I'm talking about this, I'm not just talking about uh, having an antagonistic relationship with journalists. We're talking about a guy who is recently a Saturday night went to one of his rallies, and it's, for him it's all tongue-in-cheek, but gave another speech where 
he got the crowd booing all the mainstream media outlets and saying how terrible journalists are and that they're the other and that they're terrible. Alone, that's disturbing and troubling. But listen, as my dad said even earlier tonight when we were talking about Trump, it's not a good strategy to antagonize the media, as we've seen. Uh, even for a guy running against the media, it's not a good strategy. It's pretty silly. Uh, but beyond that, we're also talking about a guy that's simultaneously uh, embracing guys like Duterte, who he ridiculously invited to the White House, and Erdogan, who he congratulates on getting more uh, dictatorial powers. And so if you have a guy that's simultaneously saying the media is terrible, journalists are terrible, they're the enemy of the American people, and you're lauding people who are in the business of jailing and killing journalists, it's pretty serious business. Uh, of everything Trump does, uh, aside from there's the international embarrassment we suffer, but We've seen the Congress and people marching have been able to face off against stuff pretty well domestically, but there's nothing you can say to a journalist in Turkey right now about what he's doing. The damage is so incredibly severe, and that damage is also, of course, being done to our own media. So I feel like every reporter has to be a war reporter. They have to fight this like a war. They have to work together. From the very first press conference when Jim Acosta from CNN said, uh, asked a question to Trump, and Trump said, I'm not answering your question, that's fake news. Nobody else in that room should have asked a question until he answered Jim Acosta's question. CNN is not fake news. They're not great. Their panels are ridiculous, but they're not fake news, and that question should have been answered. As soon as you move on, that's divide and conquer. So I really feel that the people in the media have to stay together. That's why I say I am Spartacus. When he calls somebody out, the other guy's got to say, no, I'm Spartacus too. They have to work together, even if it means competitive journalists and outfits like the Washington Post, the New York Times, actually getting together and having meetings occasionally about what their strategy is against this. I think it's worth it. This is not business as usual. It's, I'm not talking about his political positions. I'm talking specifically about demeaning the media. It puts a big check and balance at risk in our country, and it's putting thousands of lives at risk uh, across the world. Uh, the next rule. The next rule is that the first, rough, uh, the first rough draft of history is too rough. People call journalism the first draft of, rough draft of history. That's why I call next draft, next draft. It's not really history, but it's the next draft uh, after the first rough draft. But what we've seen lately, this was before Trump. The speed of the internet created journalists, a uh, um, uh, feeling in journalists and media outlets that they had to keep up with that pace. And that's turned out to go to a big disservice to them and to us. Uh, the first real example of that we all saw was Gabby Giffords, the uh, congressperson who was shot in Arizona, and uh, it went all over the internet, all over news sites, not just the internet, but all over mainstream news sites that she was killed, even though she's still alive now. And what made that so interesting to me was the site, the, uh, sorry, the uh, outlet that reported that she was dead was NPR. And I mean, imagine that we feel so compelled to be speed that a uh, a news organization that we associate specifically without speed or any urgency uh, does that. I mean, there's, I always joke that they're so mellow at NPR that'd be like, uh, we interrupt this because a suitcase bomb is detonated in downtown Manhattan. About 700,000 people are dead, but we'll be back to that after this tip from Emerald or whatever. I mean, they're so mellow, and yet they were the ones who made this mistake, and it was such a telling moment. Um, so, in general, I think that uh, news organizations have to make sure, well, uh, we saw that speed come in other areas. I'll talk about that as I get a in a little further here. Uh, I feel like this speed leads to the le five least common words on the internet. Let me think about that. We need our journalists to do that for us, not to become one of us in the social media madness. We need to draw a clear line between those two things, what the internet's talking about and what journalists are talking about. And that's why I say you're editors, so edit. Twitter, Facebook, social media is a great place for journalists to disseminate news, but it's a shitty place for journalists to absorb and intake news. Um, and we've seen it over and over that they try to become a part of that conversation. They put their brands at risk for generally almost nothing. And if we look back that this is a war that you have to be right about this stuff, uh, we've seen examples where it's been, uh, big mistakes have been made. Um, you got uh, one time a, a Time Magazine reporter uh, reported that the MLK bust had been removed from the Oval Office. 
It turns out it hadn't, although I think they put it back. It doesn't matter. It's a nothing story. It didn't need to be reported urgently, but it was fuel for Trump to say, look, you can't trust the fake media. Um, we've had a few other examples of that. We had even as recently as the Patriots, the New England Patriots going to the White House, a uh, New York Times journalist tweeted a sh crowd shot that showed how many fewer people of the Patriots showed up this time than last time they won the Super Bowl. Uh, a, who cares? Seriously. That's framing things according to Trump's version of the world. But more importantly, it turned out that it wasn't quite right. The seating was a little bit different. So at another time for Trump to go on Twitter and say, you see, you can't trust the New York Times fake news. Well, it's journalists racing to be part of a conversation where most of us are sitting back with a beer and a vape on our couch having fun. They don't, that's not their job to have fun on Twitter with us and to try to be the first to share something no matter how sort of useless it is. And a lot of times on Twitter, I also think that the fa outrage is faux outrage. Um, even, even the story about the United person getting dragged from the plane, it's interesting because we've all been on planes, but compared to the big news of the world, it's not that we think it's that serious of a story. It's just a hilarious, it has the mixture of being somewhat hilarious that it's United, right? Twitter was basically invented for people to criticize United. Um, <laughs> And people are going nuts about it, but it actually inches its way up to the top of the news, like the Hamilton story when Mike Pence went to Hamilton. That story is made for Twitter. It's 11.30 Saturday night, only the weird addicts are online, and it's like, oh my God, something we can joke about and make fun of and do weird puns and memes and everything. That's our job as consumers of news or friends talking to friends. If you were a journalist walking by the front stoop 20 years ago and you overheard something, you wouldn't immediately share that on the front page. But that's sort of the situation we have today. Um, if you want to cover sports, cover sports. This is a big one. Almost everybody in the news, but especially the cable news outlets where our main man gets most of his news and a lot of Americans do also cover, politics is sports. The problem with that, I used to be a sports reporter. I love sports. If you want to cover them, do it. I'm going to be done in time for the Dodger-Giant game tonight so my sister can get watching it in time. But this is not a sport. And if you cover it as sports, then the people who run it as if it were a sport have a huge advantage. What did Trump say the entire campaign? We're going to win, we're going to win, we're going to win. Using a sports term, it was effective because the media had laid the framework that this is a sport and that we judge politicians by how many points they score, not by whether or not their policies are good. There was no policy discussions during the, the campaign whatsoever. That's a situation the media set up and Trump came along and capitalized on that situation. He didn't create it. Uh, the next one, here's a, one example, the health care. When the health care bill or two-page thing was first launched, this is CNN's headline when it didn't pass. It's not that 24 million people aren't going to lose their health care. It's that the CBO report is going to give Democrats more ammunition. It's all covered as a sport instead of the issue. Every time you do that, you give the people who cover things more on the surface an advantage. Uh, know your shit. This is important. We see this over and over. Watch as you're watching the news, even over the next couple weeks. It's getting a little better, but watch over the next few weeks. Almost every time Trump is interviewed, uh, and I'm using him as an example. It's politicians in general, but we're talking about Trump in the news. Uh, he gives an interview. The interview goes where they say thank you. He pushes his Diet Coke button. They get their Diet Coke. They split. And... Uh, then over the next three days, everybody goes berserk because Twitter fact checks it and the New York Post check, I mean, the New York Times fact checks it, Washington Post. Everybody fact checks and then everybody says all the things that were wrong in that thing. Well, that's too late. You have to know it's wrong at the time. Uh, people have to be more prepared. This is, like I say, it's a war. People have to get up their game. I think journalists are doing that also. The other thing to keep in mind for journalists is to make sure we draw a clear line between the anger and the expression of that anger. The anger is, uh, the real, is a very real thing in America, right? And a lot of red states and a lot of rural areas, a lot of corp company towns, people are suffering dramatically. It's not the same economic divide as we've had for the last 50 years. It's not the same old story that people have been talking about for years between the haves and the have-nots. This is, the spread is getting much wider. We're seeing this incredible technological change, which is closing factories. We're seeing the exact same thing in France happening. That's why Le Pen is gaining steam. We may hate the visible 
uh, political outgrowth of that anger that we see brought out by people like Trump at his rallies with people being racist and uh, people being anti-immigrant and all these other things. Those things are frustrating and we can be angry with the expression of that anger, but we can't discount the anger because the anger is real. And that anger is tied back as much as anything in this country is tied back directly to our community and our tech community because they see uh, an industry, I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm a startup investor also, so I'm part of this. They see an industry that is sort of the story in the last 10 years where people are making billions of dollars and acting like they deserve those billions of dollars, that, it does, that it's not just about bringing a shovel to a gold rush, which doesn't make somebody a genius. And they see people not having any humility about it. You know who deserves $2 million for four years worth of work? Nobody. Nobody does. So we have to realize what role we have. I'm not saying people shouldn't make the $2 billion. Believe me, I'm all for it. But we have to have some humility and understand the damage that's being done. If Facebook wants to do something about it, forget about the news feed. Open a goddamn office in a red state and hire some people. That's where the differences will be. So I just think it's important, especially out in places like Berkeley and, I, you know, I'm a liberal American. We're mad. Don't, don't uh, sort of put together your anger for Trump and whether or not the people are really hurting out there because they are, and it's not, it's not the same as it's always been. Uh, the last one is, the last rule is call a lie a lie. Uh, journalists are getting a little bit better at this, but the thing that most irritates me is, I don't know if you guys read the Washington Post, they have a thing every time Trump gives an interview or speaks, they give it a certain number of Pinocchios. The New York Times will fact check an interview. These terms do not fit anymore. It's framing it as if uh, this is just, he's giving a normal interview like a normal president and occasionally he slips up a little bit or bends the truth a little bit. We're talking about a completely alternate reality uh, being created. I just hate four Pinocchios. Even Repetto said, you're lying, dude, when Pinocchio lied. It just doesn't make sense. The most ridiculous headline I saw in this area so far was from the New York Times. Trump says refugees are flooding U.S. in a misleading illusion. You know, I mean, how hard do you have to work to uh, avoid just saying it's a lie? They are not flooding here. In fact, every word he says about immigration is a lie, but you have to point that out, even, even, to, uh, even if you're preaching to the choir. Uh, so there's a few issues that people, uh, as I said, I want to talk about some rules for journalists and then also why those rules might not work, uh, no matter how well they're followed. And uh, scare, uh, unfortunately, I think that's the case. One is the whole issues of distractions. And we've seen a lot of people, I think the most common thing I see on liberal Twitter is every time somebody covers any story, they say, oh my God, don't get distracted by this story. It's all part of a plot to take you off the real story. But I don't know what, for a while the real story was Russia, then it was North Korea, then it was that uh, the president of China is now acting as a remedial teacher for our president. Uh, whatever it is, um, I personally believe that that's inaccurate, that the distraction is the story. We've had tons of people that refuse to take jobs in the administration because of the distractions. People are watching these news conferences. So first we had the Hamilton tweets, and everybody said, oh no, the Hamilton tweets are just distracting you from the 25 million settlement against Trump University. And that was just really a distraction against that Trump can't handle Saturday Night Live. And then that's a distraction from that Mexicans will never pay for the wall or that the swamp is being replaced by a more expensive swamp or that he don't want you to know about the women's march or Mike Flynn getting fired, the unhinged press conference, the claim of three to five million illegal voters, the Muslim ban getting banned everywhere he went, the Obama wiretap claims. Uh, on and on we go, the administration's ties to Russia, which is the big one everybody points to. All the jobs announcements are from like eight years ago, but he's making them now. The fact that Ben Carson is actually a cabinet member. <laughs> Don't let that distract you from the failed sanctuary city case. And uh, maybe this is all meant to be a distraction that, from the fact that in reality, none of us know where the hell that armada is that Trump keeps talking about that was supposed to be headed towards North Korea. And all of this is actually just one giant distraction from the fact that almost nobody showed up for the inauguration. <laughs> so the Pod Saves America guy, John Favreau, said, I can't wait to click on more stories about how stories distracted us from other stories. It's not, a, the, the distractions are the story. They are the problem. Uh, so I don't buy it when people complain about that. Uh, 
Even Trump is distracted. Here's his interview with the AP, which was the most absurd interview in history until today's interview. Uh, okay, the thing I learned, uh, I've learned to do that I never thought I had the ability to do, I don't watch CNN anymore. Uh, AP, you just said you did. No, I mean if I'm passing it. What did I just say? You just said, where, where? Two minutes ago. <laughs> the distractions matter, even he's distracted. For those who think that this is a grand chess game against everybody else playing checkers, yeah, think again. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, some of the issues, like I say, that are impeding journalists even if they do their job really well. Uh, the first one is fake news. You hear about it constantly. Uh, and in order to get into the fake news, on fake, Facebook is sort of the main uh, vehicle through which we get that. So uh, I just want to give an example. Recently, my wife took my, and I took our kids to Japan on a trip and we uh, spent a night at a traditional inn uh, where they got to dress up and take baths and take their shoes off and eat their food. This is how the trip really went. I don't know if anybody with kids here, does this look at all familiar right here? <laughs> this is the way every goddamn family trip goes right here, right? This is the photo that we shared on Facebook. <laughs> so people talk about fake news on Facebook. Everything on Facebook is fake news. Everything. People do not expect to see the truth on Facebook. Now, Facebook is starting to try to do a few things about this, and my friend Sunil Paul, who's here, is also doing a lot of stuff about stopping fake news. Uh, here's one example that somebody sort of found in the wild before they really released it. And you can see Trump, unsecurity and Android's device, source of recent White House leaks, and then below it, they put disputed by Snopes and PolitiFact. You know, I think that stuff is somewhat helpful, but if you don't believe that the Earth is not flat, and you don't believe that climate change is real, are you really going to have your mind changed by a site called Snopes? <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, the bigger issue that happens on Facebook that's much bigger than fake news is something called the dark arts, where uh, people will use, uh, they'll find people who are actually not far to one side or the other, but they're very lukewarm Hillary supporters, say, and they'll target them with an ad that says, hey, save your trip to the poll, vote here for Hillary, they click the button and says, thanks, you've been voted, go Hillary. And out of 100,000 people, they do that to maybe 500 to 1,000 think, great, I voted, that was real. Well, if you're winning districts in Wisconsin by you know, 500 to 1,000 votes, that makes a difference. That's the stuff that's really dangerous on Facebook, I personally think, even more than fake news. As bad as fake news is, fake search is even worse. Uh, people don't they're not getting this from their friends, they're getting it from a machine, and a machine they trust a lot, probably the most, one of the most trusted brands. Here's an example of, is Obama planning martial law? And you see that it says, yes, he is, uh, and explains how. This is something uh, that Danny Sullivan, a guy who writes a lot about search, calls one true answer. It used to be when you searched Google, you would get a, a series of results, and you would go through those results and see which ones uh, you wanted to click on. Now Google, of course, is we're moving to a mobile world. No one's going to scroll through anything. They want to give you the answer there. If you search for a giant score, it comes up there. They don't take you to another site. Well, this is really dangerous in this case, as you can see. Uh, Google is also trying to fix this problem, uh, but um, you know, Square World Society insists the world is flat. This is real, also claim the world is flat, you can sail over the edge, claimed by fact check, it is false. But again, if you believe the world is flat, are you going to believe that a site called example.com is going to change your mind? <laughs> you won't believe Dan Rather, but you're going to believe example.com or your science teacher or the fact that if you keep walking, you don't reach the end. But this is going to do it. The danger of this is not, it's great they're doing things about it. The danger of it is, is that we're now tasking these giant tech companies with uh, deciding which information we should and shouldn't get. And it's off the subject, but if anybody wants to talk about it after the, after the talk, I mean, we, when the internet first started, we sort of celebrated that we have these new sort of tech companies and startups and a different spirit and a holier than thou spirit as opposed to the old companies that we used to have in yesteryear. Well, none of the old companies wanted to attach electrodes to your brain, transfer your thoughts onto a, a, to a computer, and then have you wear goggles to overlay their reality on the outside world. The new boss is much more dangerous than the old boss. So th that's the problem with stuff like that, this stuff in my mind. Uh, a few other issues. Um, fake news is big, but real news was a much bigger thing in this election. This story alone did more to change the election than a thousand fake news stories right here. 
Uh, the timing of this was big. That's not necessarily why she lost, but that is it. So the timing of the news, uh, the timing of the news is another one. I'll give you an example of that. This is something journalists can't necessarily control. Here's a story. U.S. says Russia directed hacks to influence elections by David Sanger, who's like the main guy on security, the main journalist covering security, international security. This would have been a huge story. As we know, it did grow into the biggest story about Trump even to this day. But it had no effect on the election. If you look at the date, October 7th, 2016, anybody know what other story came out about 20 minutes after this was published? The grabbing the pussy story. We became obsessed with that story. That timing of the story buried anything about the Russia story. It totally dominated the campaign. I would argue it ruined uh, Hillary's, uh, in a way, her campaign. She was right on message up to that point, always saying, he's unfit for office, he's unfit for office, he's unfit for office. And he was saying, she's crooked, she's crooked, she's crooked. And she had a slight advantage, albeit very slight in that. Once this story came out, all it was about was a million scandals uh, and it doesn't matter if he deserves being criticized for the scandals. That messaging, uh, distracting message, uh, really hurt her a lot. But mostly, I just want to talk about the story. That's not a journalist bias. It's just timing bias. Uh, the other one is the bias of omission. Remember how everybody thought out here the Women's March was like the biggest event in the last 20 years? One in five American newspapers ignored it altogether. No coverage, not just not the front page, no coverage. The bias of font size, this is what Fox is great at. Remember when Comey gave his uh, testimony the other day, uh, about a few weeks ago, and it was like the biggest deal ever. They said he was investigating uh, Trump and other members of the White House. Well, look at the font size where they mentioned that part of the story, <laughs> right? Um, Another issue is that even if journalists follow all the rules I said, they do everything right and they cover it just right and follow all the rules, the chasm is not being crossed. So here's a graphic that I got from uh, some friends of mine at the Social Machines uh, Unit at the MIT Media Lab, and I think that it's pretty self-explanatory, so I'll just move on. <laughs> if you look at those white parts that are sort of blinking right there, uh, that is verified mainstream journalists tweeting, okay? Those are, so those are people who work for New York Times, Washington Post, that are verified, have the blue check tweeting, okay? The yellowish part down towards the bottom are basically us and other people like us, the Berkeley liberal uh, Hillary, strong Hillary supporter. That red blob up at the top, that's the Trump voter. No interaction whatsoever. And out of anything we talk about the media, the media, I don't know if they can really solve this problem. This is really the biggest problem. And uh, I'll just tell a quick story that I think explains it a little bit. I used to teach high school in Brooklyn. And one day we were in high school class and uh, we were doing a book called uh, Native Son by Richard Wright. And the day that we were teaching the class, we had a visitor who was the child of a, a uh, the niece of a, another teacher in the school. And she was visiting and she was sitting in on my class and that was the only day during my two-year teaching career where there was another white person in the class besides me. Uh, all the kids were either Caribbean or African American. And the day of the class, we were talking about a part of the book where this character, Bigger Thomas, has committed two murders, and he's on the run in the Chicago tenements. And we started with a journal question. If you knew where Bigger was, would you uh, turn him in? A third of the class said they wouldn't turn him in because the uh, legal justice system would never treat him fair at that era Maybe not now either, but certainly not in that era in Chicago. So they wouldn't turn him in no matter what. Another third of the class said they'd turn him in uh, because even if that's true, uh, murder is wrong and you, can't, you have to draw the line uh, for either religious purposes or whatever. And the last third of the class said they would turn him in, but not because they thought he would get a fair trial, not because they thought it was a right or wrong issue, just because they worried that they might be the next victim. So I said, well, how many people in here have either had a person killed or uh, a friend or relative that's been killed? And every hand in the class went up. At the end of the class, the student from an LA school, AP class, AP English student came up to me. She said, you know, we just read that same book uh, in my AP English class in LA. And if you had asked that question in my class, everybody would have thought you were joking and started laughing. Nobody would have thought you were serious when you said, would you turn him in? Of course, we would have all turned him in. And it occurred to me then that my background here at Berkeley, learning about multicultural education, all that stuff was sort of a big lie. 
that the only time you have multicultural education is if you have people from different cultures discussing something. It doesn't really matter what the topic is. If you have black people, white people, and brown people in the room, men and women, then it's multicultural by its very nature. If you don't have that, it's incredibly dangerous. And right now we have a regional segregation in this country that's incredibly dangerous. Think about the way we think about red states. It's a lot of the way that people used to think about going to a, a dangerous quote unquote neighborhood back in the 80s and 90s that you thought if you got out on the subway in Brownsville in New York, oh my God, I'd be so scared. I sort of feel that way uh, as a liberal Jewish guy. Uh, now, if I got off the bus in a, in a red state, it's not real. The reason it works is because we're segregated, right? One of the reasons Hitler's message works so well, and I'm not comparing Trump to Hitler, which is really a useless exercise, but the reason that his message works so well is originally uh, they had a trouble saying so many terrible things about the Jews because people, uh, his messaging propaganda people said, but they live next door to the Jews. So we're saying they're X, Y, and Z, and they're saying, well, I know a Jew, and he's not like that. That's when the ghettos came. That was one of the most effective uses of the ghettos. Once you had people ghetto-wise, you can recreate a story about them. Well, we're doing that in America both ways. Forget Trump. Like I said, we have to be able to separate that. We're doing that both ways, and it's a really big problem. And I don't think media can solve that problem. Uh, people aren't reading the stuff anyway. Um, so uh, when I was teaching this class, I thought when the, the internet was first emerging, I thought, well, the internet will solve this because the internet will allow you to have busing without the buses. You can have black kids and white kids communicating without having the politicians agree to have seg uh, integration. It's all going to solve the problem. We'll communicate together. It'll be a great panacea and buses without the busing. I mean, busing without the buses, everybody getting along better and understanding each other. So uh, I made this prediction at the time. The internet will bring us together and make facts and truth more accessible. Well, as we know, <laughs> whoops, I did that too fast. Sorry about that. Strike that, reverse that, but did not come true. I think, I personally think if everybody who worked on the internet in the early days of the internet knew how it would turn out, they would have been a lot less enthusiastic about it because we all thought that. Um, Another thing to understand about this separation, I call it separation anxiety. Uh, it takes one to know one. Six states accounted for 59% of unauthorized immigrants in 2014. Let's just take one issue. Those states were California, New York, New Jersey, Illinois, Florida, and Texas. Blue state, blue state, blue state, blue state, one red state, and you know Florida, who can explain Florida? But the places with the most immigrants voted against the anti-immigrant candidate strongly. That's not by coincidence, because they couldn't be framed as these weird enemies that are destroying your community, because they're your neighbors. You've even seen people in a lot of border states seeing their neighbors getting hauled away and saying, wait, I didn't mean him. Well, we have to be able to communicate with each other, otherwise that'll always happen. This little girl sign says it better than I can. My best friend is a Muslim, and she is nice. Getting that across to people is incredibly hard. Maybe... One good thing about the Trump era is that it's helped us clarify those values and realize that we have to do something about it and fight, some, fight for it. So who's winning in this circus that we're attending? Well, we know Trump is winning. He tells us every day. Uh, the news media is winning. Here's Dean Baquet from the Times. Trump is the best thing to happen to the Times subscription strategy ever. Every time he tweets, it drives subscriptions wildly. Recently, they did about 500,000 new subscriptions that people could donate to school kids. It's nonstop uh, money coming in compared to the old days there. Uh, TV watching is in decline, but news consumption is booming. Think about all those layoffs at ESPN earlier this week. If somebody had told you a year ago that ESPN, the one last thing that makes people keep cable and direct TV, would be doing layoffs and struggling in the news media, CNN and MSNBC would be raking in the money, you'd never believe it. They're winning, even if they might complain about Trump. Believe me, the bottom line is that they're winning. Um, here's another example of that, a, a, a recent story just last week in the New York Times. CNN had a problem, Donald Trump solved it. The comedians are obviously winning. Bill Maher, Trump is good for business, I'll give him that. Um, the only real losers in this uh, might be us, the news consumer, because we're being constantly overwhelmed by news and a lot of times it's doing more harm to our psyche than good. And I always like to remind people anytime I talk that the first goal of a news organization. The first job of any news organization is to convince you that the, of the inherent value of news. I live news, I absorb news, I think about news all the time. 
but it is not more important than walking your dog or talking to your kid or just even having your psyche be free for five minutes to watch a TV show. The goal of news organizations is to convince you it is. That's why when there's a 24-hour news story that CNN can lock into, they do because they want you locked into it. I love the news. I'm in and of the news. But remember, that's their goal. They're selling a product. They want you to believe that product is uh, important. Um, the most least meaningful words, phrase in the news business, breaking news. This was actually a breaking news headline on CNN's site. Blacks are more likely than whites to be wrongly convicted and spend more time in prison before it being exonerated. It's like, honey, there's institutional racism. Come over quick. <laughs> Big breaking news, right? Uh, another one. This was a, took up half their page. Trump speaks during Holocaust remembrance. We don't have to have a breaking news alert every time he speaks. The only breaking news if Trump is speaking at the Holocaust remembrance is if he remembered to mention Jews. Uh, notifications. Everybody gets them. They're really not good for your health. I get them too. Here's a few examples of ones I get and how useless they are. No one has seen Richard Simmons in public since 2014. There's even a podcast about it. Hey, uh, sorry, son, I missed your hit in the Little League game. I was just checking this. Uh, White House strategist Stephen Bannon led a mysterious lifestyle with no fixed address as he built the conservative movement. This is like two months into the, elect, into the administration. Who cares? How is that breaking news? Turns out Joe Biden loves the Biden-Obama bromance memes. And now we finally know his favorite one. Hey, I'm sorry I can't make your uh, bat mitzvah today. I got to check out this uh, Biden thing. Uh, I'm, I must admit that I sometimes fall into that too. This is a recent next draft notification I, uh, one I sent. I can't tell you what's in this edition because I think we're being wiretapped. And uh, this one, I'm sending this while eating the most beautiful piece of chocolate cake. Uh, and every time I show this, I figure people want to see the cat behind there. So there's my cat. And in full equal time, there are my dogs. They're obviously bigger fans of my work. You can tell by their outfits. How prevalent are these notifications? Half of Americans get them, I mean, more than half of Americans get them all the time on their phone. Think about how crazy that is. Not people in the news business, not people who are politicians. We're getting this all day long. Uh, so my last reminder is you're not Batman. You don't need to be notified the second something happens. <laughs> I had an Uber driver tell me he didn't have a good time on New Year's Eve because he was, this was in L.A. because he was worried about the violence he was reading about on his phone. And I said, why? What happened in L.A.? He goes, oh, not in L.A. In Istanbul, there was a uh, car bombing, and I was just really looking around and being tense. That's how crazy people have gotten now. We don't necessarily need to know everything that's going on. So my last message is don't let your obsession with ingesting and interacting with the news become a fixation that consumes your every waking hour. If you do, you might become president. So that's it. I'm going to get, uh, thanks for coming. We're going to have uh, Deirdre English uh, from the journalism department, a former editor of Mother Jones is going to come up and are you going to introduce? Oh, well, no. Such a great uh, she's going to come up and she has actual knowledge from working in journalism and working with journalism <laughs> students. Uh, as opposed to me. But before we do that, I just want to thank everybody for coming out. I know it's a pain to drive and park and talk about a topic that's uh, torturous. And so I really appreciate uh, people coming out and uh, listening to my nonsense. It was great. Let's come over here and So uh, I've been asked to wait for Now it's on. Uh, I've been asked to respond to this presentation, which I will do uh, for a little while, and then I'm sure that there are many, many questions out there. We're all, uh, we're all sick, addicted news junkies, um, like you. I, I know I am, and uh, we're all, I think, really anxious because uh, I, I think you've done a good job of convincing us, and I agree that this is a real crisis for democracy. What we're facing right now. And so, but it's easy for you. You just have to be the managing editor of the internet. Uh, I have to actually convince young people to go into this field of journalism. So I teach at the Graduate School of Journalism here on the Berkeley campus. It's a very small, almost like a little boutique school with just about 120 students. Um, but they are, they, are, they are warriors. They do think of themselves as being like war reporters. 
Um, you know, I always dread graduation when I have to talk to the parents, and the parents <laughs> sort of saying, do you think my son or daughter is going to make a living? Or, you know, well, no, it's not that easy. Let's talk a little bit about um, how, we, how we got into the fix that we're in. Um, first of all, we have to, you know, what was happening before Trump came along? Um, the decline of the business model for journalism is a massive catastrophe. So um, journalism has always or been supported by advertising, um, and that's always had its extreme problems, um, and it's which we could talk about, but at least there was money there, and it supported a lot of newspapers. Now we have about 40 or 50 percent fewer reporters working in this country than we did 20 years ago, um, and a massive number of small and medium-sized newspapers have folded. Um, in, and where have, where have they folded? They've folded in um, smaller cities. So uh, they've folded in red states. They've folded throughout the Midwest. And one thing that hasn't been talked about very much is that the, the elite coastal media, the big, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the LA Times, uh, and others, they depended on these small and medium-sized newspapers and those reporters that were in um, rural America and small-town America or medium-sized America, they depended on them. Uh, they got a lot of information from those reporters and they would get a feel for those communities. That's, you know, there's a big difference between being there and reporting all the time um, and helicoptering in. So how did the uh, big coastal elite newspapers respond to this breakdown? They turned to pollsters. And uh, this has been a massive, um, uh, embarrassing defeat on the part of the press. And uh, the, the, um, the fact that uh, all of the major mainstream media predicted a Hillary victory based on pollsters and were caught in you know the, the, the realization that they didn't know what they were talking about um, has sent huge shock waves through journalism. And you know, yes, now I think there are because now there's been a surge, as you pointed out, there's been a surge of new money coming into journalism. It, it's not going to come close to compensating for the collapse of the business model. I wish I had a graph to show it, but it's a, it's a little blip uh, on what's still basically a downward trend. Um, so, you know, where's the new money coming in from? It's coming from subscriptions. Well, subscriptions don't pay for journalism. Advertising pays for journalism, and advertising is gone. It has left the house. We can talk more about why, but it ain't coming back. I mean, all those people who think that it, oh, it's gonna be fine because advertising will just migrate from the print media to the digital media and solve the problem. No, that hasn't happened and there's no prospect of it happening. And we can get into those details about why not. I'm sure you'd be good at explaining it, Dave. Um, anyway, uh, so um, yeah, with the small amount of money that's now you, you could say, if it's not a false illusion, flooding into journalism. Uh, certainly I know that the New York Times and the LA Times and the Washington Post, they're aware of this problem, they're hiring reporters, they're sending reporters out to the red states, they're trying to get people to be, you know, do more of those kind of cross conversations, but it doesn't come close to coping with the problem that, that MIT um, graph that you put up shows, yeah. And um, it, it, it doesn't even begin to scratch at that problem. So uh, we at the Journalism School, we, we started this semester with a, a panel on fake news. We had Adam Mazzari, who's the vice president of the news feed for Facebook, was there. He minimized the problem, uh, just as um, Zuckerberg has been doing. Um, up, up He's, he's, he's moving a little bit off that position, but you know, they said, oh, fake news. We're aware of it, but it's a very small problem. They're, they're not facing up to the extent of the problem that, that they have caused for democracy, for, first for journalism and second for democracy. Um, we ended the uh, semester, uh, the semester is almost over, and uh, I just came from a two-day conference on investigative reporting. Um, that we just had at the journalism school, and we had, 
you know, key reporters from CNN and Bloomberg and the New York Times and the Washington Post and you know all the all the big places and and all the great investigative reporting outfits and we you know all asking them about these problems that you've been you know so interestingly um, calling to our attention and they don't have the answer. I will tell you, they do not have the answer. And I've sat through too many panel discussions at the journalism school in, with you know, business minds and journalists and CEOs talking about you know, how to solve the problem of the bo broken business model of journalism. Nobody knows. Uh, how do you solve the problem of the complete breakdown in reaching across communities and you know, the, red, the, the polarization of our country? They don't know how to do it. How do you deal with the whole fake news problem and the propagation of, of um, false information with malicious intent, whether it's coming from Russian hackers or whether it's coming from people making a profit, sometimes a big profit. Pe you make a better profit from fake news. A friend of mine said the advice we should be giving journalism students is they should go into the fake news business. You make more money, um, which you do. Uh, some great stories about that. But they don't have the solutions. They don't have the solutions. And um, Ev Williams, who was one of the founders of Twitter, spoke at this conference I was just at. He sounded very much like you did in the 90s. Uh, I mean, when he, when he looked back, he looked back similarly to you. He said, you know, oh, we thought that, uh, and, 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 um, that connecting everybody would really be cool. It would be a really cool thing to do. And uh, it would tend to lead to good social outcomes. And that was very embedded uh, worldview of set of values and an assumption, an untested assumption, in the minds and the hearts of a lot of the great tech entrepreneurs of the social media phenomenon. Um, Mark Zuckerberg, there's a, you should all read yesterday's New York Sunday, uh, uh, Sunday Magazine um, article um, by a great tech reporter, um, the cover story, it's mostly a profile of Mark Zuckerberg, and uh, you know, it really illustrates this exact same point, that he comes from a, what I have to say is an idealistic but very naive belief that connecting everybody is, um, was kind of you know, prima facie a good thing. And it, actually, a lot of social science, as the writer pointed out, shows that um, there are great dangers that occur um, in um, people in people in groups and and, and um, with the way in which people can be led in groups and so on, so I think your parents' experiences with the Holocaust um, do bear on some of the things that we need to be thinking about when we think about group dynamics and uh, the rise of social movements, the rise of authoritarianism um, in a deeply divided um, state and a state in which we now do have propaganda substituting for reliable and trustworthy news to huge, huge parts of our population who say that they trust Trump more than they trust, quote, the media um, by large numbers. And uh, so, you know, this is my response um, <laughs> so far. I'll, um, I'll just uh, perhaps, I have lots of questions for you, but I know the audience does too. Um, I'll just, uh, you know, remind you of the the infamous words of Steve Bannon: "The media should be embarrassed and humiliated and keep its mouth shut and just listen for a while." He said to the New York Times, "I want you to quote this: The media here is the opposition party. They don't understand this country. They still do not understand why Donald Trump is the president of the United States." I think there's a lot to think about in the uh, words of Steve Bannon. Yeah, I'll probably disagree, disagree with that point. <laughs> <laughs> you want to turn that on? Uh, oh, how do you do? Just flip the little switch up. Oh. It's in the yeah. middle somewhere. <laughs> yes. Steve so Bannon is a jerk, but he was right on that one. So I, think, I think in a way that's the most interesting thing about this above and beyond all of this, which is that no matter how we talk about the coverage, fake news, real news, Trump did not hide who he was during the election or during any part during his entire life. There's nothing that somebody who has followed Trump throughout the years would be surprised that he doesn't know anything about the Civil War, but yet would feel compelled to talk about it anyway, that he doesn't read 
the health bill, but would feel compelled to make guarantees about it. There's nothing about that that we didn't see during the campaign. The, he didn't describe any policies, and yet people saw that and wanted it for a variety of reasons. And to me, that's the hardest to understand. Uh, you know, I'll cop to that Steve Bannon quote. I don't understand why people did, but we better figure it out quick. And it does have something to do, I think, with our behavior. I think the local to local story is the bigger one and where this problem ultimately has to be solved. But in terms of the national story, um, I always think of the coal thing. We are in the heart of the environmental movement here. And people talk about solar and wind, and that's all great, but they talk about coal like it's this terrible thing. If you are a third or fourth generation coal miner uh, in Virginia, you have given your hours and many years of your life for several generations to powering America through industries, through wars. You deserve to be lauded and welcomed into a more healthy industry, not to be ripped as part of this backwards, terrible industry that we decided two years ago was the worst thing that we ever had, even though it's been powering us for 200 years. And I think that attitude is so corrosive that if I put myself in Virginia, I can see why people would look at uh, really specifically our industries here in the Bay Area because we get so much of the media coverage and just say, they don't give a damn about us and they're right. And I think that's a big problem. Well, I agree that, you know, that there are, that there are coal miners, hundreds of thousands of coal miners who, you, you know, are, are facing a financial catastrophe unless, and, and they don't, you know, it's, it's not enough to say that they should be retrained. Um, but, uh, you know, the good news is that there are more jobs in alternative energy now than there are in coal. And uh, I'll just counter what's happening to the coal miners to say nobody talks about what's happening to journalism. We're watching the downfall of an important industry that's a backbone of democracy. We are seriously watching the uh, jour journalists are like coal miners. Yeah, it's actually one of the greatest tricks that Bannon and his crew did was creating, creating a wedge between working class America and journalists. Because as you say, journalists also don't make that much money. Their industry is going into the toilet as fast as the coal mining industry. Journalists are working class America. They should be siding with it. And if you read, incidentally, if you read major American newspapers, the story of the coal miners, the story of the red states having problems and technology upending jobs and all that was covered endlessly. The opioid crisis, it was ignored by the Democratic leadership, there's no doubt about it. They didn't talk about it. The fact that we've let this opioid crisis go in this country, here it's like a story. This is a massive epidemic across huge swaths of the country. If I lived in those swaths of the country, I would not trust the government to get anything done anyway, either. It's like the biggest story. Everybody there has a relative who's OD'd and nothing is being done about it. Nothing's being done to the pharmaceuticals who do it, uh, who are pushing this stuff. And you can see how people give up. Even Flint, I think, is another good example. You know, we, when we separate the story, why are people angry? I always thought if Hillary Clinton just went to Flint and solved the goddamn water problem there, we'd drop people in the middle of the desert in Iraq and have running water in like two months. Mm -hmm. You're telling me that when we put the full force of the American engineering and construction public behind this ridiculous, blasphemous situation in Flint that we can't fix it? That's where she should have been. Fix that, you position Trump as a blowhard. Um, so I, I do get the anger for sure. We're here to talk about media, I guess, but they're both connected. Well, no, I, they are completely connected. And the anger, I think, it, you know, uh, is, it, it became explosive and it's finally captured the attention of the, the uh, liberal class and uh, the, the, wealthy, the wealthy classes. Um, and begun to, they began to realize that um, the, this rise of populism, which we saw both in the Bernie campaign and in the Trump campaign, and we're now seeing, and we saw in England, and we're seeing in France, um, has everything to do with class rage. And uh, on, uh, on the opiate crisis, I'll just say, I like a quote from uh, my friend Barbara Ehrenreich, who said, why does everybody talk about an opiate crisis in this country, why aren't we talking about a pain crisis? And put that together with the unbelievable rise in the number of what are termed deaths of despair, 
among um, middle-aged white males throughout the center of the country um, who, you know, I think we've all read, uh, are now ha have a, a, a shocking death rate, a high proportion of which is from suicide. What drives people to suicide? Physical and emotional pain and despair. So, you know, the signs are there, and th I think the challenge is, is there. It's a huge challenge, actually. It is so much deeper than waiting for Trump to be out of office. Um, and, uh, it, it, you know, it, it is uh, a, um, a, a real challenge to the truth, to what the nature of the truth is, and to community, uh, and the nature of community in this country, and whether, in fact, we can um, offer the country reputable, sound information that addresses their needs and speaks to them respectfully and offers them some solutions and makes them feel that the coastal elite is in some way um, caring and in some way offering to solve some of the problems that they've been trying to tell us about for so long. So anyway, that's my response. I think that was a tremendous um, call to arms on your part, Dave, and I'm uh, one of your fans and readers, and uh, I'll just say one other thing about you, which is I just think it's so great that there's an actual human being who is the curator uh, of the internet, and your competition is Facebook's newsfeed. And um, you have a couple of hundred thousand followers, and they have a couple of billion. And uh, the Facebook news feed is not curated by human beings. It's curated by algorithms, and it completely creates a filter bubble for you and everybody else. Um, and it traps you in that little portion of that, you know, nervous system that the MIT lab put up there and makes you think that you know what's going on and know what other people think. And you don't. And you don't know that you don't. And it is a tremendous intellectual problem that everybody should be pondering um, in terms of how it's actually uh, corrupting the way that you perceive the world. Um, so thank you for raising the alarm and depressing us and scaring us and also giving us a little bit of a way out through humor. Thank you. Thank you. Depressing and humor are my two specialties. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure there are questions right here, and I think somebody is supposed to bring you a mic. Yeah, and talk right into it. So my question is, what is news? Is it really news to repeat whatever our president says if we know that he changes his words, there's no meaning, and all of that? Maybe the trouble is that news has become entertainment. And clearly this country is heading towards becoming entirely an entertainment society. We pay the highest wages to football coaches and the like. Either we do games or we take entertainment through the media. And to me it feels most of what the news offers is really some form of entertainment. And maybe that's what's really wrong. Um, I mean, I think there's Definitely, I said covering it like a sport, I think also turning it into entertainment. I think it's a tough line to draw, should we be covering every word he says, he is the president. So it has to be covered, does it have to be covered as breaking news and everything covered live? No. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the media needs to do a better, a better job of not, I think it's not just enough to not cover the news as entertainment, as entertainment to, but to make hard news more entertaining. Um, Deirdre and I were talking about this earlier when uh, she teaches feature writing here at Berkeley and I work occasionally with uh, the Center for Investigative Reporting or not work with them but talk to them and that's one thing I'm always telling them make that first paragraph kill even if it's a totally serious topic that everybody should know about the reality of the world is people are flipping through pages and if you don't catch them in the first paragraph they're gone regardless of whether they should know it or not so I think it's both making news less entertaining I mean, less like entertainment, but actually making actual news entertaining. Because you gotta grab people's attention. It's, you can't be totally serious all the time. Um, but again, it doesn't matter even if you do that. The problem is not that, that we're getting too much Trump. It's that 
half of America is having a completely different discussion. Hi, Dave. Thanks for uh, taking the time to talk with us today. Um, I think one of the things that's most impactful for me about what you do is the act of curation. Um, I'm, I'm a practicing designer myself in the tech industry, and it's something that's really, particularly the curation by machines, by algorithms, as something that's really been deep-seated with me that I've thought a lot about lately. And the fact that algorithms are at their core an inherent bias, they have the same inherent biases as the people who write them. And so that's why I really appreciate the human element that you bring to your work. And I, I, my question is, is how can we become more effective as individuals in curating our own collections of news and how we absorb it and being more consciously aware of the biases that we hold ourselves and addressing it? Yeah, I think that that's a good question. On, on one hand, uh, we've seen, even as recently as this week, sort of a controversial angle of that. Uh, the New York Times recently hired somebody from DIG to put together five or six stories from the right, basically, the far right, and link to those stories and describe them, much like I do in Next Draft. So you're reading some opposing opinions. And then we saw Brett Stevens get hired uh, by the New York Times, which was a huge story. Uh, in like a few square blocks of here and in the New York Times building. Probably not, <laughs> probably not in the rest of the world, but it's an interesting debate. People, and I actually sort of agree with both sides. In one sense, we are in a war over truth versus false as much as right versus left right now. So it probably was not the ideal time for the New York Times to hire somebody whose first uh, article would be questioning climate change, right? But he's, you know, I have gone fishing once in my life, but uh, I noticed that every time the fish bit the hook and the guy who was our guide hit the fish with a two by four and put in the cooler, like it's probably not a good idea to always take the bait. And Brett Stevens was baiting liberal America and getting page views and they are happy there about it. So as worried as I am about the New York Times having a slightly right and controversial character there, we have a guy toying around with a nuclear Korean Peninsula, so we have to sort of focus and choose our battles. Um, so I think it's important to get out there and get more voices, not necessarily to read the false stuff. I don't think you have to go read Breitbart unless you want to understand their strategy. But the best thing I can advise people to do is to actually either follow an individual, because over time you get to know them. It's like movie reviews. The Metacritic review of 83 or Rotten Tomatoes is somewhat useful, but if you find one TV reviewer or film reviewer that you has the same taste as you, it's much better. Uh, so just to open tabs, I never use any feeds for news. I never use RSS, nothing. I look at the tabs partly because I want to see what managing editors of newspapers want me to see the most that day, but partly because I want to get a good overview of everything. Uh, it's hard not to do confirmation bias. I don't like linking to stories that portray a truth that I'm uncomfortable with, so you have to force yourself. But I think it's really, no algorithm can ever recreate human-to-human -human serendipity. So somebody emails me a story, I find it interesting, it's from the Tampa Bay Times about some random topic. You can never reproduce that. You'll like this because you like that is the worst way to absorb any kind of human information. First of all, the power of these algorithms in this, in this area, not in making robots work and making a car, but in this area, so terrible anyway. How many times have you bought a book and you see an ad for that book for the next three weeks? I have a thing that I do uh, on when I'm browsing that I will just for fun search for uh, bikini models. And then for the rest of that day, I just have girls in bikinis on my site as I'm browsing the web. Not that that's appropriate behavior, but just to prove that it doesn't work. And I'm an investor, and anytime I go to a site to check out the latest news on that site, uh, I get followed by ads from that site. I mean, these algorithms we're so scared of don't know when I'm messing around with them. They don't know that I am visiting this site for this person purpose. They don't even know that I bought the uh, book or the other product. So trust in them to give you more of the right thing is false in the first place. But in general, there's nothing that can, nothing can beat human to human serendipity. Whether It's the same thing with Pandora. You can have a million algorithms, but if your friend says, hey, check out this band, I'm going to see them uh, in a few nights, there's nothing that can beat that. 
I was just joking about the bikinis, obviously. <laughs> That's my red state uh, humor. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there, there was something on the internet where um, somebody had taken the position that we're getting better news f uh, analysis and uh, takedowns by comedians than by news reporters. And uh, uh, I'd like to take, get your view on, on that. Well, it's an easy time to do it, that's for sure. Um, you know, almost overwhelming. It's a little bit boring, honestly, because every topic is Trump and every show is Trump. Uh, I worry a little bit about the news shows that are comedy shows that blur the line and pretend they're news. Like, I'm a fan of uh, Real Time with Bill Maher, but it's not news, and Bill Maher is religiously unprepared on topics that he debates with people from the right, and I think it's buried all the time and including when he talked to Milo recently, you know, as a topic that relates to Berkeley. So if you're going to do it, if you're going to pretend your news, you better be totally prepared in order to have really cogent and accurate things. The other area I'm actually worried about it, though, is that everybody on the Internet is, tries to be funny, right? Like Twitter, the worst thing about Twitter and social media is elaborations, right? Everybody hates at a party when you make a joke, and then a person elaborates on that exact joke. You're like, yeah, that was the joke. Twitter, that is Twitter, right? People hear a joke and then they make the same joke back to you. It's like, okay, great, we're on the same page. Everybody's constantly trying to get laughs on Twitter. That's why Hamilton event and the United thing go crazy because everyone wants to make their joke, make their meme, get the best laugh, get the most retweets. Well, one thing I think we're running in that we're at the beginning of this problem, actually, is news journalists becoming celebrities and going on shows and being interviewed on talk shows and having their shtick. I don't think that uh, people, if we have a ton of journalists that are getting fame specifically because they're uh, the left answer, the left's answer to Trump, I don't think that's a good trend either. The story should be the star, not the journalist. And we certainly should not parade around and laud journalists because they ask a goddamn follow-up question. I mean, if Jake Tapper has somebody say the microwave is listening and he says, can microwaves do that? It's like the rest of the media writes an article about Jake Tapper is the one guy tough enough to ask that microwave question. It's like, well, who wouldn't? That's your job. That's your job is to ask those questions. Celebrate the story and journalists that investigate things like Spotlight and stuff, not the great one-liner. That's my job, but don't celebrate me as a journalist. I'm more interested in being funny. That's my problem. Are they, have we depressed the audience, do you think, Shannon? Because I don't see any more questions. Or, oh, good. <laughs> um, so I had kind of a two-part question. One was a little bit of a follow-up on what was said previously. Um, how do you toe the line between trying to create personalities that uh, individuals can trust when they're following them for news, um, whether that be through a newsletter like you or through Twitter or something like that, toe that line between doing that but also not creating too much celebrity around that person. Um, and then secondly, I was wondering if you see a particular platform, I know you use Medium uh, quite frequently, if you see a particular platform that might be beneficial for trying to uh, potentially revive some of these kind of smaller town uh, newspapers and kind of spreading out the geography of news sources or whether that's something that news institutions just need to do to take that loss and just open up more offices around the country. Yeah, well, I, I definitely, I'm not totally enthusiastic about the trend we have of billionaires buying newspapers. But on the other hand, the Washington Post has gotten a lot better since Bezos take, took over, to my opinion. Uh, you have Murdoch is trying to buy the Tribune, so I'd rather uh, a nice billionaire did that instead, one I agree with. Um, I, I don't know if there's any, I don't think there is a tech platform that can make any difference with the problem we're talking about with local reporting. Uh, I mentioned the Center for Investigative Reporting a while ago. One of the things they're doing is that they're actually going and putting people in Mississippi, working with local news organizations there to get better at investigative reporting and doing true stories, forget the politics, forget if they have a different version of Trump than we do. That stuff is, fills our mind share, but what happens with jobs and family and if somebody's being mistreated at the uh, you know, chicken plant or whatever is a much bigger deal for people that live in uh, a town in Mississippi than what we think of Trump. But that, those stories aren't getting out either. And just to build on something you said about that 
that chain, how important this chain of journalism is. The local journalism informs the regional journalism. The regional journalism informs the national journalism. It, when the national journalism was doing well, you also have international journalism. And I, I have a friend who uh, is pretty high up at the Pentagon, and he says that they get a ton of uh, information about what's going on in the world from the media that they use uh, in their military tactics and to help protect people. But you look at a problem like ISIS, the number one reporter for the New York Times right now is covering ISIS by talking over social media to members of ISIS. We don't have any uh, insight into places like Syria, right? We, it's all just totally abstract because there aren't journalists on the ground. It's dangerous to us as a society to become a well-informed society, but it actually is also physically dangerous that we have to sort of realize at every level of the way, protecting an uh, undocumented immigrant that's working at a factory in a small neighborhood, all the way to protecting American interests abroad. This information channel was an incredibly important thing, and it has been largely crushed. And if it gets replaced only with, hey, here's what Trump said today, that's not a fix either. So just to end on a positive note, I think one thing that we, um, yeah, that to add a positive is that, you know, that the press remains free in this country and everybody can be a journalist um, through social media. Everybody can get their true stories out and we're not being put in jail. I mean, 50 journalists were murdered in Mexico uh, within the past couple of years. Uh, journalists are killed or imprisoned in, in Turkey, in Saudi Arabia, in Russia, in China, in, in so many places. And that doesn't happen here. And um, the outrage that people in the media feel at, at Trump will certainly protect, protect them. Um, so it is certainly um, a good time to fight back. And I think all the tools with which to fight back uh, are in our hands. So, well, thank you very much, you. Dave Pell. Thanks to both Dave and to Deirdre, uh, and also for reminding us about this incredibly important part of the democratic social contract, the, journal the field of journalism, and also suggesting that the tools might actually still be, be in our hands. It has um, really been fabulous to have you here, and to conclude, end our year, uh, we look forward to welcoming you back uh, next year with more programming, uh, where we're actually hoping to continue dialogue around these and allied issues. So thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thank